Episode 8.1, Ancient Greek Military Strategy. Hi, my name is Clayton Mills. Welcome to A Short Walk Through Our Long History, a podcast where we look at the events of history and we try to see how those events shaped our modern world. This is episode 8.1, another side trip to look at something I find interesting. In this case, we're looking at ancient Greek military strategy and weapons, specifically hoplites and triremes. I've mentioned that ancient Greece wasn't that large of a place, and they weren't as populous as some of their other larger empire neighbors that they fought against, but they were still able to defeat many of their larger enemies. Eventually, under Alexander the Great, they will conquer the largest area of land and create the largest empire that the world had ever seen to that point, but we're not there yet. Today, I want to take a look at the technology, training, culture, and tactics that allowed Greece to be so successful militarily. Different countries throughout history have had different advantages over their neighbors, And it's often these natural advantages that determine which country ends up being the strongest and the most successful. For example, ancient Egypt had the advantage of a steady supply of water and good fertile soil because of the Nile River. This meant that they usually had plenty of food and water, which meant that they could develop a large population. Food and population stability also creates wealth, so the Egyptians could not only use a lot of men to create a large army, they could afford a large army because of the wealth generated by the steady supply of food. So they could field a large army, which made them successful. It's partly because they just had food and water. It often gets overlooked in history just how expensive it is to have an army. Navies are even more costly. And then now there's air forces and space forces, and man, it's, it's really expensive. The U.S. budget for just defense spending last year, 2021, was over $750 billion. With $750 billion in cash, you could literally buy all the real estate in Greece, like the whole country. The U.S. spent that in one year on just the military. Unfortunately, none of that was used to destroy our current federal government, which really seems to be the biggest threat that the U.S. faces right now. I mean, our own government is a bigger threat to our liberties and our way of life than any foreign government is at the moment. It's not like Mexico is massing a huge army on our southern border planning to invade. Maybe they're massing a huge army of drug dealers and human traffickers, yeah, and maybe that's kind of an invasion, but it seems like our government's actually paying them to come. Hey, let's pay the invaders. That seems like a good strategy to keep them from coming here illegally. Yeah, we need some way to defend ourselves from our own government. That's not a new issue that's happened many times throughout history. People deciding that they have to defend themselves against their own current government. Well, governments, one of the things that they do is they create armies and they sustain those armies. And armies are expensive today. They were expensive back in the ancient world as well. And to keep an army in the field, you had to feed them. You had to move them with carts and horses and all sorts of equipment. You had to provide food and equipment for the soldiers and all the people who were helping the soldiers. And then you had to pay all these people. This costs a lot of money. This was one reason that there was so much looting and pillaging back in the ancient world when an army would capture a city. It was a way that the soldiers got paid. Soldiers could make a lot of money in a good looting. This helped with their usually sort of meager pay. In fact, many soldiers took the job of being a soldier, not because they got a good steady pay from the government, but because they might have the chance to go loot Athens or Sardis or some wealthy city whose army they had just defeated. It could make you pretty rich, at least by the standards of the day. But back to my point, which was that if you wanted to have a good army, it helped to have a sizable population, a decent food supply, and enough money to pay for the army. But but then, once you had an army, which you could use to defend yourself, You also had to take them out every so often and fight somebody. You had to send them out to the countryside to go fight somebody or else the army would get restless and start fighting you, the government. You had to have an army to defend yourself, but you had to take them out from time to time and let them destroy your neighbors. That's sort of what armies do. 
So it's kind of a catch-22. You have to have an army to defend yourself against your neighbors, but because you have an army, occasionally you have to go attack your neighbors because otherwise the army gets restless and attacks your own country and takes over. Another advantage that countries had, besides having a good army that was loyal to the actual government, another advantage was natural resources. For example, in Mesopotamia, there's not a ready supply of tin or copper. They didn't have those resources. Um, and you need tin and copper to make bronze weapons. So every Bronze Age empire in Mesopotamia had to go foraging outside of their country borders. They had to go up into the hills to the northeast of the Tigris River and try to capture the land where the copper and the tin mines were. They had a resource constraint they had to overcome. Those resources, for some countries, give them a natural advantage. So let's look at Greece. That's where we are now on this side trip, looking at Greece. Let's look at Greek, Greece's natural advantages. First of all, Greece had a relatively stable growing season and reliable water supply, so a not a hugely abundant food supply, but a steady food supply. They didn't have a whole lot of farmland because most of mainland Greece is hilly and kind of rocky, but they could grow olives and grapes and other things besides sort of farm crops. They have also an almost infinite coastline, and they have all these great harbors for ships. So with their ships, they eventually ended up sailing all across the Aegean and eventually the whole Mediterranean to trade for things that they didn't have, like wheat and corn and other grains. They were expert sailors and fishermen, uh, fishermen so that they were very at home on the water, unlike some of the other Mediterranean cultures. The Egyptians, for example, almost never sailed out onto the open waters of the Mediterranean. They stepped stayed inside in the calm waters of the Nile. So the Greeks would sail out of their islands, they'd sail to places like Egypt, and they would bring the grapes and olives and other things that they had grown, and they would trade them for wheat from Egypt, for example. The Greek coastline also meant that they could do a ton of fishing. So if you were a person who liked fresh fish cooked in olive oil, ancient Greece would have been a good place for you. They also had decent land for raising sheep and goats. The rocky mountainless land was difficult to travel in, which meant that smaller city-states tended to be the norm in Greece rather than one big empire, even though they were all bound together by the same culture, language, gods, and often by treaties to support each other. The mountainous terrain made it difficult to move armies around, so the Greeks were somewhat protected from neighboring tribes. Also, Greece had its own native supplies of copper, tin, and zinc, etc., so they could make their own bronze weapons. So, despite being relatively small in terms of population, Greece had some natural advantages over Persia, Egypt, Assyria, and some of the other larger ancient empires. But now we get to the part that I think is interesting enough to make an extra episode about it, Greek weapons and strategy which was really one of their best advantages. The bit about geography just now was, was background, and it helps explain why the Greeks fought in the way that they did. Your average Greek soldier was not a professional soldier, but was only a soldier part-time during the campaigning season or when there was an outside threat. The rest of the time, they were middle-class landowners, shopkeepers, fishermen, something like that. I say middle class because you, to be a soldier, you had to provide your own armor, helmet, shield, sword, and spear. That took a bit of cash, so your average subsistence farmer might not have been able to do that. So all this stuff was made of bronze. Bronze is made by taking copper, melting it, and mixing in tin, zinc, arsenic, or some other things. Good bronze, well-made bronze, is much stronger than copper, and it holds a better edge on a sword or on a spear. If you have a copper sword, and someone with a bronze sword hits the copper sword, the copper sword is just going to either bend or have a big dent in it. So having a good bronze weapon is an advantage over those who don't have those. This is, of course, why this whole era was called the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age is followed later by the Iron Age, because once people figured out that they could make even stronger weapons with iron, well, really, it was a type of steel, then those countries had an advantage over the peons who were still using bronze. Classical Greece exists at the end of the Bronze Age, just before the beginning of the Iron Age. 
The Greeks had good bronze, and they had become very adept at making bronze things, including the weapons and armor for their soldiers. A Greek foot soldier was called a hoplite, and there were also soldiers who were archers, and there was cavalry as well. But let's take a look at what the foot soldier's equipment was, because it's the Greek foot soldier who really made the big difference in these famous land battles. I wish I could show you a picture of this, but hey, this is a podcast, right? So no pictures, but just Google hoplite and you'll see a lot of pictures. They were really actually pretty cool looking. So a soldier would have a helmet made of bronze, usually with a big crest on the top made with horsehair. These helmets were heavy, probably 20, 30 pounds of bronze sitting on your head. I don't know why they added the horsehair crest on the top. That seems like it's even more weight and just kind of like up there and cumbersome, but it was a common feature of helmets in the ancient world. I guess they thought it looked cool maybe. I don't know. It does look cool, but it doesn't seem to be helpful in any way, and you're adding weight to an already heavy helmet. The soldier also had a breastplate made of bronze that covered parts of their back and all their sides. These were heavy, at least 50 pounds. They also had a large, round shield. Their shields were a bit bigger than, say, Captain America's shield, and instead of vibranium, they were made of just plain old bronze, but the shield was heavy too. The shield is big enough to cover them from their shoulder down to their hips. But that's a heavy piece of bronze to be that big in a round thing. So they're carrying a lot of weight in bronze. And then on top of that, they had a big, long spear that also was very heavy. Now, most of the spear was made of wood. The tip of it was made of bronze, um, but it was still a very heavy spear. Soldiers often also had greaves, which are like sort of tall bronze socks that covered their shins. And they wore either leather or bronze gauntlets over their forearms as well. So they were pretty well protected in most areas from slashing and stabbing and arrows falling on them. They used their shields as a unit to protect them from flying arrows. So if you picture a big square group of of guys holding shields, if they were given the order to protect from arrows, they would drop to their knees, hold the shields in front of them, and then the next row would make kind of a row above that. And they'd make this thing that was... Uh, later called by the Romans testudo, which means turtle, they'd make this big sort of shield of, uh, or umbrella of shields over the whole unit. And arrows could fall on them and they wouldn't hit, go through very much and wouldn't hit anybody. So it was very, very, they were very well protected against that kind of arrow attack. So the Greeks used the weaponry to protect them from arrows, and then they also used them for the close hand in, uh, close in fighting, where they're gen- they were generally more protected than the enemies that they were fighting against, who usually wore lighter armor. That includes the Persians. The Persians wore a little bit of armor, but not as heavy an armor as the Greeks. To wear all that armor, you had to train for it. You had to be prepared to carry a hundred pounds of armor and fight in it, because it's heavy. And the Greeks knew how to do it, so they were in good shape and, and were able to do it. Now, some Greek soldiers had a different form of armor that we don't know all that much about, Um, But it's called linothorax, which was a kind of tunic. Instead of a bronze breastplate, they had a a tunic made of linen. That doesn't sound very sturdy or protective, does it? No. Here you go. Here's a nice loose t-shirt. Wear that for your armor. That should work. No, but apparently the Greeks had this way of taking layers of linen and and laying them on top of each other and gluing them together in sort of cross-hatched patterns. Um, and and several different layers of it to make this flexible, breathable cloth armor that was much lighter and cooler than bronze. Now, some people have recently tried to recreate this armor, and they found with that with several layers of linen glued together, they could create an armor that would stop an arrow or stop a sword from penetrating or prevent a sword slash from cutting through it, which I find kind of amazing. It's sort of the Greek equivalent of Kevlar. So some of the soldiers had bronze breastplates. Some of them lightened things up a little bit by wearing linothorax. The weapons the hoplites carried were a short sword made of bronze and a long spear. The spear usually was not a throwing spear. They held onto it and basically stabbed people from a bit of a distance. More on that in just a minute as I describe their formations. The Greek soldiers fought together in a unit known as a phalanx. The basic idea of a phalanx 
had been developed by the Sumerians years ago, but the Greeks improved it. The Greeks used a phalanx that was essentially a big square. In a phalanx, the soldiers all fought as a unit, and that took a lot of practice, a lot of training. Instead of fighting as a mob of individuals who were just chopping at whoever came next, like you see in the big battle scenes in like the Lord of the Rings or something, uh, they fought together as a unit, and, and they obeyed the, uh, the commands of whoever was commanding that particular phalanx. The soldiers lined up shoulder to shoulder, with their shield always on their left arm and their, their spear in their right arm. The shields protected them, but it also protected the soldier to their left. With the right arm, they had the spear, and if they lost the spear, they would pick up their sword. The front line of this phalanx was just a long line of shields, side to side to side, with very little gaps in it, and then spears sticking out over the shields. And then the next line of soldiers, just behind the front line, also held up their shields and put them on against the back of the people in the front line, and then they laid their spears over that too, so that there was a second layer of spears. And then the third line did the same thing, and the fourth line, and so on back, so that basically all of the spears were pointing forward, and everybody had both a, sh a shield in front of them and a shield in their back pushing them along. And it ended up moving kind of as a big unit rather than a bunch of loose individuals. At the very front, in front of the phalanx, that you would see all these spear points sticking out. And it wasn't just the first line of spears from the first line of soldiers. It was the second and third lines. So if you got past the very first line of spears because you got inside it, you ran into more spears. It, it's very much of a hedgehog, porcupine kind of thing. You're going to get stuck if you get close to it. The Greeks used an eight-line phalanx. So they had eight lines deep of soldiers. And that was deeper than other enemies usually used when they would set up lines, it was usually three or four lines of people. And so if you had eight lines of guys and they were all pushing as a unit, you could push through another line. As long as your unit stayed together, as long as your phalanx stayed as a unit and, and pushed together, they could push through um, enemy lines and, and then break the lines. And then they would turn as a unit and they would fight in, in the direction they needed to fight. If in the middle of the fight, the spears got dropped or broken or the enemy was too close, they would pull out their swords and they'd begin to hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but they would still try to stay in a unit and, and fight as a unit. They would try not to break down the phalanx because it protected all of them. The front line, if they got tired, they could fall back through the second line. There was a command that could be given and, and they would just basically step in between the soldiers behind them and the new soldiers would step forward and they could rotate their way forward and backward. So if the front line was really tired because they'd been fighting the, right, the hardest, they would just rotate and, and push through. It was usually the best soldiers who were put up at the front first, right? And, and if they needed to fall back, you knew you were, you'd been having a pretty big fight. It was a very powerful formation overall and tactically very efficient, but it took a lot of training and a lot of practice, and so a lot of the other armies didn't use it. If an enemy, like the Persians, used a simple line of soldiers or they let the soldiers run loose like a mob, the phalanx would basically crush the enemy line. Think of it like a solid block or brick of soldiers just pushing their, its way through a loose crowd. Right? As long as the phalanx keeps moving and stays together, it's going to push its way through. In the Battle of Marathon, the Greeks and the Persians lined up across from each other in long lines across the battlefield, <clears throat> and then they started marching towards each other. The Greeks intentionally thinned out their line in the middle so that they would be as long as the Persians, who were much more numerous, because you don't want the enemy to run around the sides of your uh, line and get behind you where they can stab you in the back. So they thinned out the center of their line, but they put full phalanxes on their left and right flanks, you know, eight men deep. The Persians, who were much more likely armored, had a different strategy overall for, for battle. The Persians generally, when they met an enemy in the field, the first thing they would do was unload an enormous volley of arrows, you know, darken the sky with our arrows, that stuff. And then they'd follow with a cavalry charge right up the middle that would break the enemy lines. Then the foot soldiers would come in and, and defeat the enemies, often just by sheer numbers. Well, the Greek general at Marathon, Miltiades, had actually fought under the command of King Darius of Persia for a while, so he knew the Persian strategy. He also knew that the Persian cavalry was not there with the Persian army. 
so he marched his troops out quickly before the Persians expected him. The Persian cavalry was away on their on the way to Athens itself, perhaps hoping to take the city unguarded. The Persian and Greek lines closed in on each other. According to Herodotus, the Greeks covered the last 400 meters or so at a run, still in formation, which, first of all, that's hard to do when you're wearing all that armor, but it's also an unusual tactic for the Greeks. They didn't usually run like that. They usually just marched forward. The Persian archers were firing away, but the arrows didn't do much damage against the Greek armor and the Greeks who were holding up their shields to protect themselves. The Greeks phalanxes kept their shields up even while they were running and, and protected themselves um, even as they ran across the field. So the lines crashed into each other and the hand-to-hand -hand fighting began. The Persians had their best troops in the middle and they pushed forward there and pushed the Greek lines back and the Greek center gave way. But then the thick Greek phalanxes on the flanks, on the left flank and the right flank on the ends, they began to squeeze in and they began to push the Persian lines in on themselves. The Persian lines collapsed and their soldiers began to panic and they started to turn and run and they ran for their boats. The Greeks pursued them. They caught and killed many of them. The stories that we have say the Greeks in this battle only lost about 190 men while killing 6,400 Persians. That might be an exaggeration, but even if it is, it's still, like, it's clear it was a very lopsided battle and a huge victory for the Greeks. The Persians that survived got on their ships and they sailed back across the Aegean Sea to Ionia, or what's now Turkey. The Greek armor and their phalanx strategy had beaten the much more numerous, but lighter and more mobile Persians. Well, the Battle of Marathon turned back Darius, but his son Xerxes comes back to Greece with a lot more men. Hey, they're not going to flank me. I'm going to have so many men, they won't be able to get around me. But this time, the Greeks had the advantage of just their own terrain, which I mentioned before was hard to march through. Xerxes' army first met the Greeks, um, and the Greeks were defending a narrow mountain pass near the town of Thermopylae. The Greeks basically put up phalanx and in the middle of the pass and just plugged the pass with a phalanx. And so no matter how many troops Xerxes threw at them, they would not budge. It wasn't until the Persians snuck around through a back trail to attack the Greeks from behind that they were to, able to make any progress against the, the Greeks that were there. And as I said last episode, King Leonidas of Sparta, he sent most of the Greeks home except for his 300 Spartans, and he stayed behind with them, as well as 700 other Greeks who volunteered to stay and, and face the Persians and hold them off for a while. The Spartans believed that the only way to return home was to return home victorious or to die gloriously in the field of battle. They didn't come home after a retreat. The Spartans just weren't much for retreating. Let's take a bit of time to talk here about the military culture of Sparta and these guys who are fighting against the incredibly more numerous Persian soldiers of Xerxes. The military culture of Sparta was a unique thing in the ancient world. Well, unique until the Romans come along and make professional legions, I guess. That, that, that's kind of the same thing. And those legions admired the Spartans very deeply. I said a bit ago that the soldiers of most of Greece were farmers, shopkeepers, etc., not the Spartans. The Spartans were the first place in the world that had a class of full-time professional soldiers, and they took it very seriously. In fact, if you were a citizen of, Sol of Sparta, you were a soldier. The Spartans saw themselves as descendants of Hercules, or Heracles, if you like the Greek pronunciation better. If you had been born a male citizen, you were, first of all, a descendant of Heracles, and you were a soldier. When you were a boy, and you were born, if you, if you were a citizen, you were basically trained to be a soldier your entire life. Now, the citizens of Sparta were the soldiers. They had a lot of slaves who lived in the city and did a lot of the actual work. Spartan women, the ones who were married to a male citizen, were the ones who ran the households, ran the businesses, and kept a watch on what the slaves were doing because the men were off training and off at war. The boys and men would group together from early ages to be um, at, set up in groups that would train together and eat together and live together. And so they were often off with these groups, living with these groups, training. 
By the time the boys were old enough to be part of the army, the boys had had years of training and had trained together as a team for a long time. They knew what was expected of them. The end result of all of this training and living together as soldiers was that the Spartans were the best warriors in the ancient world. They were in great shape. They were able to carry the hundred some odd pounds of bronze armor without much trouble. They were trained to work as a unit. They understood battle tactics as a unit. They understood overall battle tactics and strategy. And they all shared the belief that to die on the field of battle was the ultimate honor. It was the best way to die. Supposedly, when a Spartan man left for battle, his wife or some significant woman in his life would hand him his shield just before he leaves and say, with it or on it, which meant either return victoriously or return dead. Now, of course, this probably never happened. Very, very, very few people were ever carried back to the city on their shield because like when they died, they were usually buried in the field where they were fighting, not carried back to the city. But it does accurately depict something about Spartan culture. You either win or you die trying. And the Spartans usually won. Well, or they died fighting like at Thermopylae. So while the Spartans had the best army in the ancient world, the Athenians were more focused on their navy. Unlike Sparta, which was inland, Athens was right on the coast. Part of what made Athens such a great and wealthy city was its substantial trade with other cities all across the Mediterranean. Athenians knew how to sail, even in the choppy, unpredictable waters of the Mediterranean Sea. The Greeks created also the first sort of battleship of the ancient world, the trireme. Another thing you need to Google and look at because it's just visually very impressive. The trireme was a long wooden ship with rows of uh, rowers all along both sides. Three rows usually like sort of stacked together. And in the front, they had a long wooden spike that sat right at the waterline and stuck out along the prow of the ship, usually capped with a, some sort of a head of bronze at the end of it. And this spike at the end was designed to plow into the side of another ship and poke a hole in it right at the waterline, which would cause water to gush into the other ship and, and cause the other ship to sink. Um, they also had another tactic where they would take that long metal prow and drive it through the oars of another ship on one side, basically taking the oars off of that side of the ship, which would render that other ship unusable. Because if you only got oars on one side, you're not going to go anywhere except maybe in a big circle. The Greeks also had their own version of Marines, right? They had uh, a group of soldiers on each ship, hoplites that were stationed on ship, and their job was to jump on board the enemy ship and engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat and take over the ship. They would then destroy the enemy boat or take it over and use their rowers to row the ship out of the battle. The triremes, like I said, had three rows of rowers, top, middle, and lower. There were as many as 30 on each side, right? So on each row. For the math challenge, that's 180 rowers on a boat. They could, they could get up to about eight miles an hour, which is a lot for a rowboat. Also, these boats were big and heavy, so a big, heavy boat going eight miles an hour with its long metal-covered prow crashing into another boat, it's going to cause a lot of damage. So naval battles were a huge mess. Boats crashing into one another, oars breaking, people being killed with arrows, hoplites boarding enemy vessels, people shooting firing arrows, ships on fire, things sinking, just chaos everywhere, and, and lots and lots of drowning because apparently, despite being sailors, many of the sailors did not know how to swim, which seems odd to me, but that's how it's described by the historians. So lots of drownings. The Athenians invested a lot in their navy. The triremes could be used for battle or they could be used for ferrying the armies to other places along the coast. Also, the Greeks, being regular sailors, uh, frequent sailors, that is, they knew their coast. If you take a short look at Greece on a map, again, Google that, you'll see that it's an almost endless series of small islands, coastal peninsulas, inlets, and just wildly irregular coastline. If you add into that, like rocks and shoals and narrow places and tricky winds and all the other things that are part of the Greek coastline experience, 
it's easy to see how an enemy navy would have a hard time fighting in Greek waters. So, the Persians had a hard go of it. Some of Darius's soldiers were killed on boats that sank in a storm in the Mediterranean just before the Battle of Marathon, so he didn't have his full army because a lot of his boats sank. Then later, some of Xerxes' soldiers drowned when their boat bridge across the Hellespont well, that's the narrow gap between Asia and Europe, when their boat bridge collapsed. Um, Xerxes was so mad about that that he had some soldiers go and flog the sea with their weapons and throw chains in it to say that the sea had been imprisoned by its master, Xerxes. As far as anyone can tell, the sea basically ignored Xerxes and went on being the sea as it always had. The Persians did, though, rebuild the bridge they got their army across, and they kept going, of course, until they got to Thermopylae and the Spartans, where they had, as I said earlier, a bit of a pause when they ran into a solid Greek phalanx blocking the pass. The battle at Thermopylae held up Xerxes' army, but the navy was still out there. Eventually, the, the Spartans and the other Greeks at Thermopylae were defeated, and Xerxes' army comes through and sacks Athens, but the real win for the Greeks comes when the Greek navy defeats the Persian navy at Salamis. I mentioned this in the last episode. The Greeks, who knew the area, they lured the Persian navy into a narrow strait between the island of Salamis and the main, mainland. The Greeks, having less ships, were more able to maneuver, and they managed to drive into the Persian navy and split it in two and drive some of the Persian ships even farther into the shore where they had even less room to maneuver. Also, early on in the battle, they killed one of the admirals, Xerxes' brother, Ariabignus, and that added to the confusion of the Persian fleet. It's worth pointing out, though, that the Persian navy was actually a very good navy filled with soldiers and, uh, from many different seafaring nations, and, and they were skilled sailors with excellent vessels. It wasn't just a bunch of land-loving yahoos. In fact, many of the Greek crews were actually brand new crews, and so some of them like, were very inexperienced. But the Greek commanders and tacticians did a great job in that battle, and, and they gave the Greeks every advantage. The Persians, you would think, had all the advantages because they had the, the, the numbers, but they didn't know the terrain, and the Greeks used that very, very effectively to their advantage. The Greeks also weren't afraid to face the Persians on the sea. And because of that, they won a monumental battle. So, like the Battle of Marathon before it, the Battle of Salamis was a great Greek victory. And the Persians again retreated. This time they didn't come back. But pretty soon, Alexander the Great and some more Greek phalanxes would again be fighting with the Persians. We will get to that soon. Next episode, back to our normal historical flow, and we will talk about the Athenian democracy and the beginning of the Golden Age of